Okay, so I think this is what people have started off. You know, the white coat, of course, represented doctors. The stethoscope represented doctors. But I think this is what a bit of a problem is, is that this is what people think. I'm going to ask all you guys a question. How many of you know at least one doctor, colleague, friend, senior, junior who takes cuts? No one? You all live in little bubbles where, you know, doesn't happen in my friend circle, group circle, or anything else. And I'm sure that's not true. It's like this famous conference where a professor was talking about medical kickbacks. And he asked the first question, how many of you take kickbacks? So obviously, no hand ever went up. And then the second question was, how many of you know another doctor who takes kickbacks? And then, of course, every hand went up. And I think this is what part of the problem is. And I think this is where we've actually let, and when I say we, I'm talking about the medical profession. In one sense, I'm one of the senior members of the medical profession, has let the medical profession down, and including all the juniors, is that it's basically be taken this ostrich in the sand attitude. We've just pretended that there is no problem. And by doing that, we've actually let a bad problem become even worse. Because if you just assume there isn't anything, how will we ever address it? And that's why I think this is what we need to do. It is the elephant in the room. You can't pretend it away. And it's not easy dealing with elephants in the room. But the good thing is an elephant can be eaten. And the secret is to eat the elephant one bite at a time, which is what we're trying to do here. Today, the truth is that medical corruption has become embedded systemically. And there are two separate factors I need to talk about. I'm not going to be talking about doctors taking kickbacks. I mean, you, know, you can use multiple euphemism, consultation fee, medical management fee, whatever. So pharma companies give kickbacks, medical device manufacturers give kickbacks, corporate hospitals, all that stuff. Today, I'm going to focus on what we as doctors give kickbacks to general practitioners or family physicians in order to get referrals. That's what I'm going to focus on. And multiple ways, words to describe this. You call it a kickback, you call it a cut, you call it a commission, you call it fee splitting. The most important thing I need to emphasize is we only do this for one reason, and that's a financial reason. There is no other reason to do this. The only motive is to earn more money. And I think pretending that that kickback system doesn't exist is really not helping anyone because everyone knows it does. And when we pretend it doesn't, when we take a holier than thou attitude, I think it creates a lot of resentment among society at large, patients. And I think this is one of the big reasons why patients don't trust doctors anymore. And that's why the reputation of the entire profession has taken a beating. There used to be a time when you would be proud to say, I'm a doctor. And I think some of that has gone away. And you know, it's not just mental or emotional. It's also physical, and that's why patients are so resentful when something goes wrong and they're happy to beat up doctors and burn hospitals down. So I think we all agree it's time to clean up the system. So why now? Why have this lecture now? And if you're not going to do it now, when are you going to do it? Are you going to wait another five years, 10 years, till it becomes even worse? And sometimes we need to ask, you know, we've kind of become so used to the fact that cuts and kickbacks are a part of the system. We need to remind ourselves that 50 years ago, no doctor ever gave a cut. So why has this become so rampant? Why this greed to get rich so quickly? And you know what is different about the doctors 50 years ago and what's different about doctors today? And of course, whenever this started, when there's a time when there was no one giving cuts at all, and now everyone's giving cuts, it's always a few bad apples which start the rot, which is fine. I don't care about that. But the question we need to ask ourselves is, why did the rot spread so quickly? The fact that it did itself suggests that perhaps there was a reason for this. We can't pretend it's not. And I think this is the analogy I want to use, that corruption, the kickback system, is a corruption. It is a cancer. And unfortunately, it's metastasized widely. And that's why the doctor-patient relationship is seriously sick. I'm really glad we're doing this in a place like a cancer hospital, obviously. But much more important, in a place like Tata Memorial, because we all know that the Tata corporate brand is a model for probity. This is a brand which can be trusted and has been trusted for over 100 years in this country. And this is a great place to be able to start. Just to let you know, I'm a doctor too. I'm not a doctor basher. I'm not playing holier than thou. I'm not trying to preach. I'm not trying to be a moral policeman. I'm just going to go down to bar stacks. And I will acknowledge the fact that the fact that it's become so rampant means people must be seeing some value in it. 
We need to identify what that value is. But the truth is, this is a wicked problem. It's not going to go away just like that. It's got to be a joint effort. And it's not just doctors alone who can solve this problem. Systemic problems are wicked problems, and they need everyone involved. This, of course, is the million dollar question. Everyone acknowledges there's a problem, but who's going to bell the cat? Not me. No one really wants to do this. So I think this is a very courageous step the department has taken. So full marks. And I'm actually hoping that this is just the starting point. We need to continue having these conversations on an ongoing basis. And ideally, we need to invite patients in these conferences so that we can look at world from their perspective. We know what they're thinking about and they can understand what our perspective is too. It's not fair to label all doctors as being corrupt. And that's actually what started to happen. So let's first look at the rationalizations and justification. You know, we all know doctors are smart and no one wants to acknowledge the fact that they're doing something wrong. So the first line is, the family physician serves a very important role in the healthcare system. He's the primary care doctor. So when he refers the patient to a specialist, he's acting as a bridge between the patient, the family, and the specialist. And obviously, he needs to be reimbursed for his services. And it's not fair that a surgeon gets paid 1 lakh rupees for a 30-minute operation, whereas the GP gets paid only 100 rupees for that same 30 minutes. So this is one way of normalizing that relationship. So they've earned the referral fee because that's what the work they're doing. The second common justification is, why are you targeting doctors? We're not gods. We don't pretend to be. We're just human beings. Every other profession does it, whether it's lawyers, architects, you know, you name it. So why should we be held to a different standard? The third, very difficult to argue with is, our seniors do it. And if our seniors do it, you know, they are our role models. What's wrong if we do it? Because the fact that they need to do it means obviously we need to. And today, of course, now that medical colleges have become privatized and they're owned by politicians and you've paid so many lakhs of rupees, you need to pay off the debt. So people are now looking for a return on investment on their education, which is why this is becoming worse. And what I'm trying to emphasize is the change has to start with us. You can always rationalize everything you do. Even a murderer rationalizes the fact that he kills someone. But it's a choice you need to make. And I think it's important that we learn to differentiate between the financial income a doctor makes and the emotional income. Did you join medicine to make more money, which is a mercenary approach? Or did you do it because you like taking care of patients, which is a missionary approach? Do you think of yourself as a businessman whose job is to earn as much as possible? Or do you think of yourself as a professional whose job is to provide the best possible medical care. Do you have a fiduciary responsibility and who is your role model? This is a slide everyone will agree with that cuts harm patients. I mean, that's obviously well known. It obviously increases the cost to the patient. It reduces the quality of medical care because the middleman, the GP, the family physician will pressurize the specialist into inflating the bill by doing more tests, doing more treatments, referring to other specialists so that the size of his cut increases. And more importantly, it completely destroys the trust between the doctor and the patient, which is sad. I think this is the one thing you need to remember. The only reason we give cuts is to earn more money, which on a short-term basis seems to make sense. But on a long-term basis, it's the stupidest thing in the world to do. And doctors are meant to be intelligent and doctors are meant to be smart. So you do a short-term kick as a result of which you end up hurting yourself in the long run. Because the reality is once you start giving kickbacks, you can't stop. Everyone says, yeah, in the first five years I'll give. Once I start establishing my name, I'll stop giving. I won't need to give. It just doesn't happen. And really, what sense does it make that you work that hard? And we all know the income tax guys take 35% away. Here you're giving 50% away. So what are you going to be left with? And the worst thing is this is all black money, which again, you know, is going to cost sleepless nights. And that's why doctors are such favorite targets for income tax officers and raids. But the reality is that giving cuts harms you. It harms you financially. Instead of actually helping you to earn more money, it actually makes you poorer. You've got to look at this not in the terms of one year or two years. You've got to look at your lifetime earnings. You're going to be a doctor and maybe practicing for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. And if you started off by giving 50%, which means you've written off 50% of your entire lifetime value of professional income and given it away to a GP, what sense does that make? Again, it's not 
how much money you earn is how much you keep for yourself. And if you give 50% away, you obviously ended up with half. And the reality is if you stop giving cuts, you can do a lot more. You won't need to see that many patients because the few patients you see will actually give you more income because the GP is not taking half of it away. You'll obviously have more spare time to do more interesting things and I'll come back to that. But much more importantly, I think you'll have a stronger spine because what does that mean? It means consultants have lost all self-respect. The reality is family physicians don't respect specialists or consultants anymore. They order them around. No, I think you should be doing this. Okay, you've done a CT. Why don't you also do an MRI? They actually make suggestions as to what the specialist should be doing. And the specialist knows that what he's doing is not medically appropriate, but he's actually being bullied by the general physician. How can you feel good about yourself when you do stuff like that? So it is a source of secret shame. I have yet to meet a consultant who's proud of the fact that he gives kickbacks. And the very fact that you harbor this sense of guilt means you know in your heart of hearts what you're doing is wrong. And why is that surprising? Why should a GP respect a specialist who's willing to take a kickback? And this is what happens. Consultants end up becoming puppets. The referring doctor keeps on squeezing you. Today, the cut rate is 30%. Tomorrow, it's going to be 40%. A new guy starts a clinic next to you that he's willing to give 50%. It's become a race to the bottom. And there is absolutely no way you as a specialist can ever win this race. And the fact is the GP is in control because he owns the patient. He doesn't allow you to own the patient, which means he tells you what to do. He tells you what not to do. And it's become a race to the bottom. And the reality is specialists have become a commodity. They don't garner any respect. They don't garner any respect from the patients, unfortunately, and they don't garner any respect from these gatekeepers who are the GPs and the physicians. And let's stop back a minute and think about why GPs, family physicians used to be so important in the past. And the reality is the GP served as a middleman. And it was important because at that time, you know, there weren't many consultants. Your, every family had a family physician you had a medical problem, you had a relationship with the family physician, he was there at the birth, he was there at marriages, there at deaths, you trusted your family physician. So that if a specialist wanted referrals, he wanted patients, it wasn't enough for him to say, hey, I'm a specialist, you know, come to me. He had to go through the GP and that's the root of why the system started. But the truth is that model's broken today. You know, people keep on moving around the country. People don't aren't stable in one place. People don't have any family relationship with a family physician anymore. And I think the important thing is if we accept the fact that good GPs serve an important role, no one's disputing that. They're the heart and the backbone of a healthy healthcare system. But the bad ones are the ones who cause a lot of harm. So why don't we just cut out where the middleman was? The reason specialists used to give kickbacks to GPs was because GPs were the gatekeepers. They controlled where the patients were. Today, they don't do that anymore. All you need to do is go where the patients are. And we all know that all the patients are online. Can you afford not to be there? But the truth is, and this is increasingly becoming a problem, you know, doctors aren't on pedestals anymore or patients are doing their best, whether it's patients, whether it's the media, whether it's journalists, TV channels, social media, judges, politicians, everyone's happy to give the doctor a bad reputation. Anything bad happens in a hospital, irrespective of what the underlying cause was, it's always the doctor's fault. And of course, even if you leave the big picture, even when you do consultations, it's always constantly, you know, every patient comes with 500 pages of Google printouts and you've got to remind them, hey, you know, I know everything you're saying, but don't confuse your Google search results with me. And I think this is a very useful metaphor. There used to be a time when doctors were thought of as kings or queens, depending on your gender. They were in control of the situation. That's not true anymore. Some doctors still think of themselves as being knights in shining armor. The patient has a problem. We will come running to the rescue and fix the problem for the patient. That's obviously ideal. That's why you became a doctor, but that's dying a little bit. A lot of patients think of doctors as knaves and thieves and crooks and only want to do stuff in order to make more money. But I think the reality is most doctors are pawns, is that it's a huge system out there. And we think of ourselves as being powerless and helpless and being buffeted by so many different forces. And we don't think we have any control. And I want to change that. So let's step back. Here's this young doctor, maybe come back from the US, you know, raring to go, very specialized. And he wants to start practice. And when he does that, he starts by giving cuts. 
And his rationalization is, how will patients come to me? There's a senior doctor down the road. Everyone knows him. Uh, the GP sends all the patients there. If I need to get patients, I need to incentivize the GP. And the only way I can do that is by giving him a cut. And the truth is junior doctors are vulnerable. You can't starve. You have a family. You spent 30, 35 years of your life getting trained to become a doctor. This is high time. You're not needed to start seeing some money. And of course, it's always possible to rationalize and justify and say, okay, when I have more money, I'll stop giving cards. So when I have enough practice, I'll stop it. All this is actual hypocrisy. It never stops. So what do patients want? And I think let's go back to the basics. What Elon Musk calls first principles thinking. Patients want high quality medical care, obviously, right diagnosis, right treatment. They don't want to spend too much. And they want doctors to be available, convenient. Obviously, when we're sick, we want exactly the same thing. So effectively, the only thing a patient wants is a kind doctor who's competent, who listens to them, and whom they can trust. That's a no-brainer. What do doctors want? And again, I think this is very simple. And there's nothing wrong with this. Doctors want more money. They want more fame. They want to publish more medical journal articles if they're academic. They want to attend conferences. And obviously, they want to balance their life, which again boils down to a very simple equation. If you have more patients, all this will automatically fall into place. So doctors want more patients, and patients want the right doctor. Marriage made in heaven, correct? Both patients need doctors, and doctors need patients. So then how do the patients find the best doctors? And this is where the problem arises. Because there is information asymmetry, they trust the family physician. And today, the norm has become giving cuts. And I think what we need to do is cut out the cuts, cut out the middleman, and create healthier options. And the good thing about the COVID-19 is people are realizing that even specialists are just a phone call or a WhatsApp away. But the reality is WhatsApp and all these apps are not enough. And this has become very mainstream because patients don't trust doctors. They all go doctor shopping. And we've all been at the receiving end of this. And of course, every patient these days has this internet doctor of medicine certificate. But trust me, patients aren't happy going to Google because every time you go to Google, the diagnosis is always you might have cancer. So what has Dr. Google resulted in? Unhappy patients because they'd rather not waste time and figuring out all these words which don't make any sense. Half the information is unreliable. Half the information is contradictory. They don't know whom to trust. Unhappy doctors, because you hate it when a patient keeps on cross-questioning you and takes out irrelevant information which is obsolete or out of context or doesn't apply to his problem and challenges your expertise. But you know, the truth is it's our fault they go to Dr. Google. And I think this is the one simple solution, which is a win-win-win for everyone. It's a win for doctors. It's a win for patients. It's a win for society. It's a win for the government. It's a win for insurers, everyone. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. Everyone needs their own website. You cannot afford to be a digital dinosaur anymore. And please, this is something which is worth investing in. Instead of wasting your money giving cuts to GPs, please invest in your website. It's very cost effective. But one thing I should say, and I've started noticing that, a lot of doctors aren't willing to take the time and effort, and they're happy to give it to a digital middleman, which is things like Librate or Practo. But really, in one sense, they are no better than the GP. These are now the digital middlemen. They create a platform, they spend a lot of money advertising, they attract all the patients. But for a doctor, it's the worst possible platform to be because guess what? Hundred of other doctors are on that same platform. So this doesn't give you any USP at all. So how do you showcase your expertise? And like I said before, you need to be online. The secret is very simple. Become the trusted source for patient education because the reality is patients don't care about you. They don't care whether you've been trained at Sloan Kettering, whether your MRI is 64 slices or 128 slices. They only care about themselves and their medical problem. So the rule is your website should not be about you. Your website should be about your patient and their problems. And more importantly, what the right solution to their problem is and how you can provide that solution. The beauty of course is digital space is free. So you can generate fresh content. And this is something I need to highlight. You junior doctors have such a huge edge as compared to digital dinosaurs like me. You're digital natives. You can do this all the time. You can create far better content than any senior possibly can. 
and tell me, you know, people will go to the GP, but they will also go online to check whether what the GP is saying makes sense, doesn't make sense. And if they see a YouTube video where you bother to take the time and trouble to explain to them, there's a very good chance they'll ask you for a second opinion. So don't forget about the power of the internet. For doctors, lots of benefits. Like I said, no cuts, direct referrals. So you don't have to answer to anyone. You do exactly what's right for the patient. The beauty, of course, is that you can create patient educational materials. And once they're online, they just remain online. It's your archive and patients will reuse them all the time. Again, no administrative hassles. You know, you can tell patients, please send me an email. Everything is documented in writing. So there's no confusion. Hey, I didn't understand this. Or what was the name of this particular medicine? Much more importantly, I think running your own website, because your website is about your patients and their problems, makes you patient-centric. The trouble with us doctors is we talk to other doctors. We use jargon. We love using fancy words which patients don't understand to put patients in their own place. We're actually being unkind. And having your own website, interacting with patients online, answering patients' emails online will make you much more empathetic, much more patient-centric. And you will force to be answerable. You will be forced to be open. Because, you know, you can say anything you like in the four walls of your clinic, but you can't lie on a website. So how do you do this? Again, very, very simple. It's not rocket science. And you can easily start a website and you can do it free if that's what you wanted. Answer the patient's queries. Please use local languages. Just be conversational. A simple way to start is to take permission from the patient and to start recording the doctor-patient consultation and then just go ahead and upload it. Your magic sauce is that you can do it in Marathi, you can do it in Gujarati, you can do it in Telugu. And no other doctor anywhere else in the world can do that. And patients want doctors who speak their language. That's how you can inspire trust. And patients don't care about what's happening in the US. They want to know what's available in Mumbai or Dadar or Parel or wherever you are. And much more importantly, by providing this information, you are establishing yourself as I am the expert who's willing to share knowledge and I can be trusted. And videos are extremely powerful. For patients, it's obvious that doctors available 24 seven accessible, at least the knowledge which the doctor has. Doctors are, you know, patients are doctor shopping anyway, but thanks to the website, they can do it sitting at home. They can get second opinions by sending emails, but they now know that this is a doctor who's generous and is willing to talk and explain stuff to me and who uses my local language. And it's this transparency and openness which creates a trust because no matter what, you know, in 10 minutes, 20 minutes, half of what you tell the patient, he will forget. The other half, he will distort. The other half, he will, you know, get some other version at all. And he'll get completely confused. And he'll keep on coming back and asking you the same question, which can sometimes get irritating for doctors. I get that. I think this is something I need to emphasize. Only we doctors can provide personalized empathetic care. No one else in the world can do that. No matter how fancy the hospital building may be, it's the software which is important, which is us as doctors. We need to create that personal bond and it's this bond which creates trust. And that's what our special strength is. But the reality is there's no point in being the best doctor in the world if you don't have patients to see. And that website creates that awareness. So again, your patients are your best brand ambassadors. There are lots of worries and doubts, especially, is it ethical to have a website? Is it legal? Will people misconstrue it as advertising or marketing? This is the standard gray beard syndrome where the senior doctors, I think partly because they feel a little bit threatened because they're so used to doing things in a particular way, they feel threatened by junior doctors. I actually believe that not educating patients is unethical. And the good thing about a website is it forces you to be transparent. Open. Anyone can see the website. Anyone can say, hey, that's not true. Or you're lying or can complain to the medical commissioner that this guy is not saying the truth. It's no longer just websites. Of course, there's lots of social media options. But I think we need to remember that patients are Googling you all the time, whether you like it or not. It's far better that you create your own website. So you are in control of what they're going to see when they Google you. Google needs you as much as you need Google because Google doesn't create any content. We are responsible for creating content for our patients. It's a huge opportunity. It's a challenge. Once you start, the more you do it, the better you will get at it. And this is something which I do. You know, I have lots of educated patients and I use them as research assistants. They will come and say, we read this on this website or we did this or so-and-so is doing that. And I say, fine, come back and discuss it with me. And then I will tell you what I think my particular opinion is. We sometimes forget 
that the word doctor is derived from the word dossier, which means to teach. Part of our job description is to teach patients. We used to do this very well one-on-one -on -one in the consulting room. Why are we restricting ourselves to one-on-one -on -one when we have digital technology and we can do one to thousand or one to million, those digital platforms are available. Please share your knowledge with patients. Don't be selfish and don't hoard it. And it only grows the more you share it. Patients will respect you more, trust you more. And part of the problem is because we don't speak up, that's why so much quackery about cancer and cancer treatments and so much misinformation. My last few slides, it's not just individual doctors who can make a difference. I think all of us together, the entire system can. And the right thing to do is to nip the problem in the bud. Start with medical students. And if we do that, and you know, if I were in charge of the National Medical Commission, I would say every medical student, when he joins medical college, has to create his own website so that everything he learns, he documents on his website, he shares with his patients. This is a living digital resume. Tomorrow he needs a job after four years or five years. Anyone can check his website and say, okay, he's done this, he's done this, he's attended these lectures, he's done these other things. It helps with their professional growth. That's a no-brainer. But it helps with their personal growth because if you're educating patients online, you're learning to look at life through a patient's lens so that these medical students can actually act as a bridge between doctors and patients. And then that's the way they will do when they grow up. They can actually create patient educational material in all the local language. Just imagine there's so much human capital in India. We will then be the world leader in producing patient educational material, which is easy to understand, simplified, makes sense. We need to create digitally savvy doctors and digitally savvy doctors doesn't mean doctors who you know, watch YouTube. It means doctors who contribute videos to YouTube. The same thing with the medical profession. I think we need to, I'm really glad that we're starting this conversation. We don't have to assume we're helpless and powerless. We're not pawns. Of course, you know, we're doctors. We spent 30 years. We have skills which no one else in society has. I think one simple step is every medical association society should have their own website. Every medical college, every department. And if doctors don't want to create their own content, they can actually create a link to that medical association website so that their website gets populated by content which can be trusted. Health insurers are actually the best position to prescribe information therapy because it's in their best interest to make sure that patients get the right treatment. Because when patients get the wrong treatment, unnecessary surgery, unnecessary this thing, it's the insurer who needs to foot the bill and that causes harm. And again, if I were a health insurer, I think the problem with health insurers is the focus is on insurance. It's not on health, which makes no sense to me at all. They should ideally set up a call center and a website. So they become the point of first contact. You know what the beauty is? The person who knows which surgeon is the best is actually the nurse in the operation theater because she watches all these 10 different doctors operate and she can see how good or bad they are, what the outcomes are. That's so true for health insurers because health insurers are the only ones who know which patient went to which doctor, how long they spent in hospital, who got better. Who got... This is invaluable data. Insurers have this data, but they don't share it publicly. And I wish they did. And then they would have this kind of objective data analysis so that patients could be referred to the best doctor, not just by medical outcomes, but because patients would provide feedback. This doctor was rude. This doctor made me wait. This doctor didn't respect me. This doctor didn't trust me. So if nothing else, it will make sure that doctors are on their best behavior too. And that's why Ayushman Bharat is such a huge opportunity to clean up a completely sick healthcare system. There's no reason why the government can't do this. None of this is expensive. It's, you know, peanuts, literally. If they created a trusted resource in all the local languages, reliable information, get people from Tata Memorial to check the oncology stuff, get people from AIMS, whatever else, this would all be available in local languages. I would be trusted because it was from the government. The government has no reason to lie to you. And on this side, they could then put up a doctor rating system where patients could say, yes, you know, this is what I felt, and perhaps doctors could respond. You guys are young, you know, you have the whole world, and just because you have an MD degree or a DM degree, or because you happen to be radiologist, doesn't mean you need to restrict yourself to only doing radiology. It's a much bigger life out there. Learn to be entrepreneurial. There's so much opportunity. You have lots of talents, lots of skills. Reinvent yourself every few years, nothing wrong. And yes, it takes time. 
But you know, this is what the exponential curve is all about. If you start giving cuts, let's take two doctors, one guy who starts giving cuts and the beginning, he learned a lot more. So what will happen to his income over time? He learned more, but he'll keep on giving more and more of it away. So the amount he keeps will keep on reducing. Whereas another doctor who doesn't give cuts will take a longer time. But once he reaches that point, his growth will continue to be exponential because he's invested in those digital patient education resources. So we'll continue getting a referral of patients directly, word of mouth, online. He won't have to depend on a GP anymore. And traditionally, this has always been true. You know, in the past, people would go give talks at Rotary Clubs, have medical camps. You know, why can't we do this online? And it's important that we create a network of doctors who don't give cuts, don't demand them. I think the only place for cuts in the medical practice is in the operation theater. There is absolutely no place otherwise. And I think we need to believe that. I think this is what you guys should think of yourself as. And there is something called the joy of practicing medicine. And sometimes we lose sight of it. It's a simple one line formula. Put your patients first. Everything else will follow. Trust me about this. Uh, there's so much positive feedback. Doc you know, patients are so grateful when you help them, even if they don't do well necessarily. Thank you, doctor. You tried your best. We really appreciate that. Trust me, a good doctor can have the best emotional income in the world. Nothing matches that. And that's something which we need to be grateful for. And again, focus on the quality of the work, not about the money and, you know, a friend has more money and has more patients. Okay, that, that's just a formula for unhappiness. A lot of what I've described is actually on this website. Uh, a lot of these books are there. And I think information therapy is the one way of bridging the gap between doctors and patients. This is a timeless quote from Hippocrates that, you know, if you love humanity, I think automatically patients will respect doctors and we will respect ourselves if we learn to do this. Thank you.